A groundbreaking event took place at the Hawthorne Western Electric Plant in Chicago. From 1924 to 1932, the very first productivity studies were conducted on factory workers. This 1973 film features some of the original workers who participated and even supervised the recording of the data. Though filmed some 40 years later, this story of the studies and their effects is fascinating. The first result of the studies was a kind of parallel to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in physics, which says that a system will change the moment it is observed. The same thing happened in the factory studies, where productivity went up among the workers, not because of any changes in their working conditions, but simply because they knew they were being studied. In psychology, this is sometimes referred to as the Hawthorne or observer effect. Today, it's a given that workers under scrutiny will work harder. That said, the real legacy of the Hawthorne study was that it opened up new channels of communication between management and workers. Those channels eventually led to both increased productivity and over time improved working conditions. From the AT&T Archives and History Center, here's the year they discovered people. Betty Woods of the State Street Council and lots of activities happening during People Week along State Street. This is Dick Helton. WBBM, Chicago. Well, I was an observer stationed in the test room during the experiments. And my job was to keep accurate records of all that happened, create and maintain a friendly atmosphere, and exercise partial supervisory function. When they asked me would I like to work in a test room, I thought it was going to be something different than what they were doing. My name was Teresa Lehman at that time. Well, we liked it. All of us liked it. You know, every day we had to do something different. It wasn't the same thing over and over. We had men working with us, uh, Mr. Heibarger and Mr. Chipman. Mostly Mr. Chipman, he was there with us all the time. He was nice. It's real nice. Hi, Mr. Chipman. Hi, Fuller. Are you in the city, old gang? I sure am. Did you ever hear of the Hawthorne studies? There probably isn't a textbook on human relations that doesn't mention the Hawthorne studies. 1924 was the year it started. It all happened at this plant, the Hawthorne Works. Hello there, Joe. How are you? Oh, just fine. How are you? You look like the blushing bride. Hi, Mr. Fuller. Are you carrying your relays with you? No, no, that's my book. These have changed a bit. We don't all look the same. That's for darn sure. Oh, your pictures. Really? I'm feeling fine, Joe. Having a great life. This retirement business is something. It's wonderful. Our cry from the old test room days. Great to see Terry. You know, this is really a fun deal to get together with a gang like this that you haven't seen for so long. Well, it is. Well, is Teresa going to show us what she has in the book there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, Teresa. I like to see that. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty oh, impressive are, looking oh, book. Time for that. How yeah, about it? Indeed. Oh, some old time pictures. Yikes. Mr. Oh, 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 you know, hey, 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 thank you. I certainly do. Yeah. Looks like my wife's features. wedding gown. Those are old times. How about this putting it on? I was me about 18 years old on that picture. Now what year would be me? The Roaring Twenties, an era of excitement like few others in American history. An era of uproar in, well, everything. A scandalous dance called the Charleston caught on, bringing hemlines up so they could swing to the new music. Ladies bobbed their hair and covered it with cloche hats. The noble experiment tried vainly to erase demon drink from America. Speakeasies, though, became as common as prohibition agents, and bootleggers were both the heroes and the villains of the age. Scarface Al Capone was a legendary example. 
Harding headlined the executive branch and Teapot Dome, but America kept cool with Coolidge. A young pilot named Charles Lindbergh flew non-stop across the Atlantic and shrank the world, earning its lasting adulation. The incomparable Bay Ruth, too, was known and loved throughout the world. But perhaps the grandest star of the era was the automobile. Nothing in the 20s revolutionized the lifestyle of Americans more than the incredible motor car. Henry Ford's development of the assembly line boosted both employment and wages and set off the modern American Industrial Revolution. Everywhere, more and more people went to work in factories, turning out products by the hundreds of millions. But somewhere along the assembly line, the workers often got lost in the rush of production. Considered an extension of the machinery, the industrial man was often less important than his output. Working conditions were difficult, supervision usually autocratic, and benefits non-existent for most workers. In sweatshops and even in better factories, it was production that mattered. At Western Electric's Hawthorne Works in Chicago in the 1920s, telephone equipment was being manufactured by 40,000 people. What Hawthorne employees had received their company paid pension plan back in 1906. They had vacations one week after five years, and they had sickness disability pay. Hawthorne was considered a progressive place to work. Those who worked at Hawthorne uh, were really respected in the, uh, in the neighborhood. It was uh, considered quite a privilege to be working here. At this and three other companies in 1924, the National Academy of Science began an experiment to determine how illumination affects worker efficiency. The premise was that output would improve if the lighting of work areas was improved. Something very curious happened when new experimental lights were installed. Output went up among those employees being studied, and also among those whose lighting had not been changed. And most puzzling of all, it continued to go up even when lights were turned down. Having proved nothing, these studies were called off by the National Academy. It might all have ended there. That's a dandy. Oh, that's uh, we're talking about the 20s. Oh, the 20s. Oh, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, we, oh that's a long oh, that's time. in another era. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a picture. Of, yeah, that's the test room there. Let's open it to that because that's the that's the test room group. Now that is the heart of the study. Chip, yeah. where were you then? I was over in this direction, in okay. front of the girls. Oh, yeah. What position did you have, Curtis? Uh, exactly the one in the middle, the blonde there. Yes, sir. Oh. The chute, can you see the chute on there? Here. Oh, here they you are. Yeah. Here's the chute. I remember when they dropped it. Relay making was picked for a new experiment when Western Electric alone decided to probe the inconclusive results of the illumination studies. Six young women assembled the electromagnetic switches while rest breaks and different hours were tried. It was the core of what would later be called the Hawthorne Studies, industry's first scientific inquiry into employee attitudes. Continuing changes in routine were freely discussed with the workers, whose output as well as involvement in the project increased dramatically. Each completed relay was counted by a tireless tape, which recorded an overall production increase of 30%. In this small room for more than five years, observers studied workers producing more in less time than ever before. Industrial history was in the making. Earlier, Hawthorne's George Pennock brought the Harvard Business School into the studies. Associate Dean George Lombard. Harvard became connected with the Hawthorne studies soon after Mr. Pennock had heard Elton Mayo give a talk in New York. Mayo was interested at the time in topics of fatigue and monotony, and Mr. Pennock thought that some of the ideas that Mayo expressed might be of some interest in connection with the Hawthorne studies. So he asked Mayo to come out to the Hawthorne plant 
and then began a long series of associations between our two institutions. The Hawthorne Harvard Cooperative Inquiry continued into the 30s, delving into production areas all over the plant. When the early returns from the relay room began to be understood, the investigators felt the attitudes of other workers ought to be explored. They began industry's first formal employee interviewing program. Some 20,000 Hawthorne people aired their feelings about their jobs, their supervisors, their working conditions, about anything and everything. In other experiments, investigators found the first clues to the social organization of people at work, an organization that seemed to have as much or even more impact on output than anything management did. Though not all the results were as dramatic as the relay room, in general, output increased wherever these tests were tried. The investigators found industry had never tapped the workers' real worth and sent the massive proof back to Harvard for compilation. When the studies were finished, the late Bill Dixon and Fritz Roethlisberger came back to Harvard with the really a ton of material of records that had been kept and accumulated during the studies. And they began the long and careful job of writing up the studies and stating the, fi the findings in a uh, systematic way. This work resulted in the publication of Management and the Worker, uh, which has now gone through uh, many printings and has become uh, a book that is well known uh, not only to college and graduate students, but also to professional workers uh, in personnel, uh, in business and other kinds of organizations. The point of view which gradually emerged from the studies was to regard a business organization as a social system. Everyone knows that people are important in business, but a way of thinking which allowed the satisfactions and dissatisfactions of workers to be thought about in relationship to output and productivity and to allow new studies and new actions to be taken had not been available before. This is the real contribution of the Hawthorne studies. So, companies discovered people and raised a question that persists. Fifty years after the studies, has modern business yet struck the balance between the worker and his job? We can contribute something. I mean, we're not just machines and we're not just there turning out the paper, you know, and just watching the sheets flow out of a machine. We have ideas how to, to uh, better the shop and... Uh, I think they found out that uh, working as a group, um, our shop really contributed something. It seems to me that, uh, like I say, the new breed of supervisor likes participative management. And uh, we've been given that chance and it's worked out so far. We're facing the supervisor and it seems more or less like he's our equal, you know, he's on the same level as we are. I think the supervisor, he gets involved more. He gives us a chance to do things the way we want to do them, if, as long as we get the job done. Supervisory attitude is, is altogether different than it was in those days. You know, you can sit down, talk to the supervisor, and tell him something about the job. He'll listen. Years ago, he was—he knew everything. <laughs> in uh, in a lot of the uh, classes in the universities, the Hawthorne studies often come up. But uh, how much stays with the? A student, when he gets to be a manager, I, I don't know. But uh, there's certainly a lot more there than we make use of. Mm -hmm.